Hi, Pathos students. Welcome to Chapter 9. This is um, discussing inflammation, tissue repair, and wound healing. This chapter is, in, is covered in three different videos. The first one, we're going to talk about the acute inflammation. And the second one, we're going to talk more about um, chronic and systemic inflammations. And then finally, in the third, we're going to talk about the body's response to tissue repair and to wound healing. In vascularized tissues, our bodies will react to harmful invasions through the inflammatory response. Inflammation is an automatic response of our immune system that happens in response to cell injury. The inflammatory process is a good thing as it helps to neutralize harmful agents like bacteria, through the process, we can remove any damaged or dead tissue. We can generate new tissue and actually begin healing. Inflammation also helps minimize or localize the injury or infection. However, it can become harmful if inflammation is prolonged. On the first slide, I mentioned that inflammation is an immune response. So let's talk about the major immune system players that are involved. It all starts with white blood cells or leukocytes. And there are two major types, granulocytes and agranulocytes. Granulocytes are so named because they have granules. The granules contain a wide variety of chemicals including histamine, which triggers the local inflammatory reaction, heparin, which prevents clotting, toxins to kill invaders, proteases are enzymes that lyse proteins, and signal molecules, including cytokines and chemokines, which we'll talk about in more detail in the next few slides. The white blood cells that contain granules or granulocytes include neutrophils, eosinophils, mast cells, and basophils. These cells and their functions are important for you to know. Neutrophils are the immune system's first responders. When there's an injury, they arrive quickly and they come in great numbers and their effects are pretty short-lived. If we have pus in a wound, that tells us that neutrophils have been on the job. The pus is actually dead white blood cells. When the number of eosinophils are elevated, you should think parasites or worms, but also realize that eosinophils may be elevated in an allergic reaction. Mast cells and basophils are also involved in allergic reactions. The second major category of leukocytes involved in inflammation are the agranulocytes. The prefix A means without, so the literal meaning would be without granulocytes. And within this category, we have monocytes, which become macrophages, and we have lymphocytes. Inactive monocytes are always present in our circulation. When they receive a signal, one of the chemicals that we mentioned on an earlier slide, they enter the interstitial space as a macrophage. And macrophages eat the invaders, but they also produce signal molecules that basically say, hey, everybody, come over here. We've got an injury here. And that helps to prolong the immune response. Within the second type of agranulocytes, we have lymphocytes. And our lymphocyte arsenal includes T cells and B cells. T lymphocytes actually kill infected cells while B lymphocytes produce antibodies. The lymphocytes communicate with each other to produce a longer targeted immune response. During normal circumstances, our vessels are lined with endothelium. And the endothelial cells keep the microbes out 
and control what can move between the blood vessel and the interstitial space. There are some other important characteristics of endothelial cells. They are able to produce agents that cause vasoconstriction or vasodilation. The walls are smooth and non-thrombogenic, meaning they don't promote blood clots. Intravascular platelets don't bind to each other, so that also means there's no intravascular clotting. There are also other circulating cells and chemicals that are available to aid in the inflammatory response and some cells and chemicals that don't cause inflammation. The acute inflammatory response is triggered by infection, immune reactions, physical trauma, chemical trauma, or necrosis from any cause. And the goal of the inflammatory response is to remove the invader and limit the tissue damage. When we have inflammation, there are five signs. And these are called the cardinal signs of inflammation. And um, we've known about these for hundreds of years. And you will hear them referred to by their Latin name, ruber, tumor, calor, dolor, functia, lace. But I want you to really remember their English names and um, understand why we have redness, swelling, localized heat, pain, and loss of function. Your textbook divides the inflammatory response into two stages, vascular and cellular. During the vascular stage, the fluid moves into the tissues, and during the cellular phase, the cells or leukocytes are delivered to the injured area and activated. After an injury, we have a momentary vasoconstriction, then followed by vasodilation. In your practice, pretty soon you'll be learning how to get a blood sample from a finger stick. And when you do that, I want you to notice that when you first prick the finger, there's no bleeding immediately. It takes just a few seconds for the bleeding to start. And that is your very quick period of vasoconstriction. We really don't know why this happens. Um, and we also don't think it's necessarily important to the inflammatory response. But what is important is this vasodilation phase. So when vessels vasodilate, there's a net flow of fluid and plasma proteins out of the vessel. So you can see that as these proteins flow into the interstitial spaces, what do you think happens because we have more particles in this space, I hope you're thinking back to our talks about fluid shifts. So because of the increase in colloid osmotic pressure, more pulling force in the interstitial space, then we will have fluid leaving the blood vessel coming into the interstitial space. So we certainly would expect some edema some pain, and probably some impaired function from the vasodilation and subsequent fluid shift. During the cellular stage of inflammation, the damaged tissues and local immune cells release chemicals called cytokines. And the cytokines signal the immune system, hey, we've got some damage, we need some help over here. So in that situation, the first responders are our cir circulating neutrophils, and they transmigrate into the interstitial space. 
And you can see here the example of rolling and then adhesion and then finally transmigration. Eventually, um, we have more leukocytes attracted to the site and more macrophages are attracted um, and the macrophages are there eventually to help phagocytose the invaders but also to clean up the damaged cells. Let's delve a little deeper into some of these inflammatory mediators and where they come from. First of all, we have plasma-derived mediators from the liver, and then we have mediators that come from the cells, and we'll call those cell-derived mediators. There are three plasma-derived inflammatory mediators that you need to understand and how they participate in the inflammatory process. There are several types of kinins, but the best example is bradykinin, um, especially in the context of inflammation. Once activated, bradykinin causes vasodilation. The liver also releases coagulation and fibrinolysis proteins. When we address disorders of hemostasis, we'll also talk about these in much more detail. For now, you need to know that we need circulating clotting proteins like prothrombin and fibrinogen to induce clotting, and then we need the fibrin to repair the tissue with a fibrin mesh. The plasma-derived inflammatory meters are, mediators are also responsible for triggering the complement system. And once activated, the complement system creates pores in the invaders, making it easier for our white blood cells to kill them. The cell-derived mediators also include prostaglandins and leukotrienes. And you'll want to remember that prostaglandins induce pain, inflammation, vasodilation, clotting, and fever. <laughs> The picture on this slide is showing the arachidonic acid pathway. Hopefully you have some memory of this from physiology. Um, arachidonic acid is made from phospholipids that are in the cell membrane. Arachidonic acid is an important inflammatory mediator. Now notice if we give people corticosteroids, we can block the transition from phospholipids to arachidonic acid so we can stop the inflammatory process cold right here. So this explains why corticosteroids are the best anti-inflammatory drug that we have. And we'll talk again more about this in pharmacology. Notice that the corticosteroids um, block the release of arachidonic acid from phospholipids. But um, without corticosteroids, then we would expect the arachidonic acid um, to form. And then we have inflammation in two different pathways. The lip lipoxygenase pathway, which results in the formation of leukotrienes. Leukotrienes work with histamine um, they have similar effects as histamine in terms of the allergic reaction. Um, they cause smooth muscle contraction, and these are important in asthma. And we actually have some drugs that block the effects of leukotrienes for asthma and other reactive airway diseases. On this side of the um, pathway, we have the cyclooxygenase pathway. Um, which form prostaglandins. And this is where um, aspirin and NSAIDs work. So um, notice that um, <coughs> excuse me, aspirin, um, prostaglandins again cause pain, inflammation, vasodilation, fever. So that's why um, when we give, when you take an um, NSAID, which would be like an Advil, 
or you take aspirin, you can um, stop some of the inflammation in terms of the pain and fevers and that sort of thing with an infection. There are some additional mediators that come from the cell that are important. Cytokines are released from one immune cell to call other immune cells. And there are over 30 cytokines. But again, I want you to remember tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-1. Also remember that chemokines are released by injured cells to initiate chemotaxis. So calling the other um, white blood cells to the area of injury. Nitric oxide is an, a potent vasodilator that is released by the cell. It helps to prevent clotting and also reduces inflammation. And then finally we have reactive oxygen species. These signal cell damage can trigger cytokine release or at a higher concentration, um, they actually become damaging to the surrounding cells. Characteristically, local inflammatory responses produce exudates. Exudates are cells and fluid that will exude from a vessel or an organ. I think of exudates as drainage. And there are five types of exudates. Um, first of all, serous exudate results from plasma entering the site. Serous exudate has a small amount of protein and um, it's very watery and clear. If you can, in your mind's eye, see a blister, now you're looking at the serous exudate, which is the fluid within the blister. We've all seen blood exude from a wound, and so um, when blood vessels are damaged, there will be hemorrhagic exudate. Fibrinous exudate um, has a lot of fibrin and a mesh-like consistency. It's kind of sticky. Um, membranous exudate happens on mucous membranes. An example might be the membranous exudate we could see when we look in somebody's throat who has strep throat. Purulent means pus. So pus results when neutrophils and other cells and tissue die and usually indicates a bacterial infection. If pus does not drain from the skin, then it collects in the injured tissue causing an abscess. Um, abscesses are pretty resistant to antibiotic therapy. So if someone has developed an abscess, that will require an incision and drainage procedure in order to um, cure the infection. And this concludes chapter nine, part one. In part two, we'll talk about systemic manifestations of inflammation, chronic inflammation, and fever.